Then my dojo, you Step, 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 step Step in my dojo, you Step in my Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell so you can be notified when we've got more awesome content for you. Lots of love. I'm Ill Gates. Enjoy. This week on the Weekly Download, we are joined by the very talented Gabrielle Watson, a.k.a. 100 Drums. She's been making some really awesome music since about 2006, so we're glad that you're here. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for joining us. I'm really excited to, to dig deep into your musical brain. What's up? Welcome to the show. What's up? Thanks for having me, Ill. Super stoked. Oh, yeah, wicked. Well, um, okay, so let's, uh, I think it's probably best if we start off by listening to some of your music because maybe not everyone has heard it. I, I assume most of them have, but you know, there still might be a couple people out there who have not. So uh, I think we should kick it off by listening to your awesome track, Deception. I just want to feel special. Can you make me feel that way? Even if it is a lie. struck by you know the the way uh you, you blend these kind of like uk influences with your own sound and everything uh I, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your musical journey like how did you come to the sound that we all know now as 100 drums ah interesting well um i have been classically trained since the second grade uh i started off with playing clarinet saxophone uh flute harp melodica kalimbas uh i tried i tried them all until i finally was told to sit down at a drum kit and use my body and i'm a very physical person uh i really am just into doing things with my hands like aside from doing music i'm also a builder uh, i weld i do woodworking so doing anything physical with my hand in body is always like a really awesome fun thing so when i was told to sit at a drum kit everything just came naturally it was very very easy for me honestly um but where i feel like i truly find my passion is in percussion top end percussion such as djembe's and all kinds of hand drums and all other types of top percussion so shakers and uh cl crashes like all of them i just prefer to kind of play a bunch of different of those pieces and elements into my music. So uh, I'd say around 14 years old is when I really discovered how much I really loved playing drums. I'm 30 years old now, so I've been playing since. Um, and uh, it started out there until I discovered electronic music, went to my first Moon Tribe party in LA, or rather the Mojave Desert, and uh, discovered like, whoa, there's a new way or different way of doing music. I had absolutely no fucking, I oh, sorry. I'm no, sorry. you can swear. It's, it's totally, you, you swear all you want. It's all good. Okay. <laughs> I had no idea that that was even a thing. So uh, exploring more into that, um, discovered Ableton and then had a friend of mine show me kind of the navigation aspect of it all, how to get around, what do things do, and then took a lot of different classes online with learning how to record because obviously I wanted to produce myself. That was the whole point. Like I could do these things with these pieces. What can I do with it? I don't want to play in a band. I don't want to be a part of a choir and I'm not in college anymore. So I'm definitely not going to join the marching band. So, uh, started exploring in that area and I am here today. Um, however, my background in music growing up was a lot of jazz. My mother listened Very to cool. jazz and a lot of R&B, so I got a lot of soul. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's a 
kind of a bit of a synopsis as to my musical background. Very cool. Very cool. So uh, were your parents like always supportive of it or were they uh, were they like, yo, what are you doing? Um, my father, unfortunately, wasn't around. Uh, he is he was in Cuba, so he couldn't be around. And uh, my mother was very absent. Uh, my father was around, you know, remotely, but uh I, I unfortunately I don't have the most positive upbringing with my parents, so no, I I I don't really know if they were ever really supportive or proud of me, but I'm proud of me. And Hell yeah! Cool. Hell <laughs> yeah! So um, so what when when did you like know that this was something that you really needed to pursue? Like like when did was there a turning point or like a decision where you were like this is the time, like, I, I you know, there, I, I know I got to do this. I'm all in. Like, when did you go all in on it? I'd say I went in about eight years ago for sure. Um, I was, uh, around that time, I was really doing music, playing some gigs here and there. Um, I have been cultivating cannabis for the last 10 years, and that was really taking over a lot of my life. And so I was like, I, I was trying to figure out how to like make both work. But I realized that in order to really achieve higher goals and aspirations, you really need to be a hundred percent in like fully dedicated, like live it, breathe it, dream it, smoke it, sleep it, everything possible. It has to be your entire life. So about eight years ago, I put everything behind me and uh, found whatever mediocre kind of job I can to keep my overhead afloat. And uh, this really started going in. So I was taking some private classes uh, from an instructor at a private university that teaches modular and synths. Oh, very uh, cool. His name is Kyle Knockerbocker. He also has a uh, mastering company called Substantial Sound. His roster is incredible. Pretty much a lot of the big dubstep artists that you know of uh, gets his, get their music mastered from him. It's one of the very... You know you got to do mastering when your name I mean, is Knockerbocker. Like, that's just like... Yeah. <laughs> that's my last name. It's so awesome. Kyle Knockerbocker. Yep, he's he's amazing. And so uh, he really got me deeper into uh, the mixing of my music, taught me a lot more about uh, different ways of live tracking, because I was live tracking in Ableton for a while, but I hated the way the latency would kick up with every new channel. Yeah, and it can get annoying. The audio quality wasn't that good, the more channels increased. So I started a new technique with live tracking and logic and then exporting those into samples and dropping them in Ableton as audio. And now my projects are cleaner and smoother. My CPU isn't going like this. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. That's awesome. So, okay. So, um, well, how, have you always lived in Denver or did you, uh, did you leave a hometown so at some point and come to Denver or like, uh, what, you know, where, where have you lived? Yeah, so I'm from Redondo Beach, California, um, just right there near Venice in Manhattan, uh, south side of L.A. Uh, and then after I graduated University of Long Beach, I met this girl and she's like, I'm going to go trim, trim weed in Humble. I'm like, oh, OK. So I went with her and then ended up staying there for almost a decade. Um, <laughs> it became a really very well weed grower. So was doing that. Uh, goodbye degrees. I guess that doesn't mean anything anymore. And uh, but because I wanted to dive fully into my music, uh, I was taking all the time that I could to figure out what would be the best way to fully be in there and support myself. So I made all my money in cannabis, started some retirement plans, and then decided that it was time to get out of cannabis and be somewhere where I could fully submerge myself in my art and my craft. And Denver is just really hot right now. Um, it's an incredible place. My agency submission is based yeah, on big Denver. up Nicole. Big up Nicole. And um, Denver is very central. So with how busy my spring and summer was going to be this year, flying out of Denver costs were butter. So instead of flying out of small Sacramento area, yeah, it's like one flight happy. to everywhere. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Denver is fairly new, almost a year now. Um, I'm actually currently in Grass Valley right now. I came home to be with oh, my cool. Um, and uh, flying back home in a couple in a week or so. But uh, yeah, so I'm glad to be doing this interview with you while I'm here in Grass Valley, home in California, and just 
calming down and getting some quiet and being around nature after everything that's been going on in the city. So this is great timing. Word up. Yeah, it looks really beautiful where you're at. Like it really, really looks nice. So you're on, you're on a boat today? <sighs> no, I, I can't vote because I'm in California right now. Although I'm still a resident of California. Not, it's a little murky. So no, 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 the know. boat. I was going to say, I was asking you about a boat. Were you on a, a boat? boat? The boat. You were on a boat oh, today. Boat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was on a boat earlier. Yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> so I thought you said vote. My yeah, God. voting is also very important, though. Very important. <laughs> Actually, I I found out about this website plus one the vote dot com where you can register to vote with a friend, and then yeah. you you and your friend can like buddy up and make sure it extra happens. So I huh. thought I thought that was pretty cool. So I've been been encouraging people to go to plus one the vote dot com. So. You know? Plus one the boat dot com. I have to but, check it out. But boats are also cool. Boats are also cool. Boats uh, are really awesome. They're fun. We went really fast. <laughs> nice. 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 Okay, cool. So um so back to music. So um, you know, in that, that track that we all just listened to, Deception, um, I think one of the the kind of coolest things about that track is the way that the, the, the timing uh, kind of goes in and out of those triplets and stuff and really like, you know, it's got that kind of like stuttering feel and like it just like it feels like it's really in the pocket, but it's also exploring, um, you know, exploring these triplets and stuff. So I was I was wondering if, um, you know, if you have any any words just on like rhythmic theory on like putting together a rhythm, like how do you go building up a rhythm uh, when you're when you're writing? Yeah, definitely. Um, how I write my music, I've learned, is very different than how most do. I actually sit with my hand drum. I turn the grid markers off of Ableton, um, and I'll just. And this is when I'm doing like kind of the first session. Like I sit, grab my hand drum, and I actually play the drum with the metronome at 140 BPM um, for about five to six minutes, and I just have this entire session of hand drum that I just recorded and uh, I build off from that. So from there, I'll like start throwing in my elements like kicks, snares and hi-hats. Those are all uh, live as well using Ableton push. However, my hi-hats, I use some jazz drumsticks on my desk with oh, the cool. Shure SM57 and I just kind of record myself playing on my desk or on my wall or on my speaker or on my counters because any different place makes a cool different sound. And, uh, so you're not oh, even drumming on drums. Like, you're just drumming on anything. I'm just drumming on anything. And with the my Shure SM57. That's it. Huh. Just Shure SM57 yeah. microphone. That's it. Just drumming on whatever. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, my my uh, high rise apartment in Denver has concrete ceilings, so I've actually been wanting to see how it sounds playing on concrete. So the next track will be concrete, jazz sticks, <laughs> sick hats. <laughs> And, uh, and then from there is when I start building. So I literally start with the fresh six, seven minute recording of just some free play of hand drums, build off that. And then as I start getting an idea as to where I want to go with the track, that's when I start doing all my live tracking in Logic because, again, my project starts to get pretty big. Ableton can't handle it. It gets annoying. So live tracking primarily in Logic. Cool. And and then are, are, you running any, um, uh, are you running any effects or anything when you're recording these things or it's just like raw mic recordings like just on it's top all of raw yeah okay cool so uh one thing that i found um that was like i used to have a real block about that and i've worked with a lot of vocalists who kind of have a little bit of a block about that especially where they're like you know if it doesn't like sound good right away they get all bummed you know and it's like um you know, I think that like, you know, what I think was a big breakthrough for me personally was learning to just kind of like let things sound how they sound while you're working and really like just just trust that there's like a, a process in place and everything. So, um, you know, and I, I think that's that's one thing that like stops a lot of people from from using a microphone. You know, a lot of people I know, like when they're when they're uh, you know, when they go to record themselves for the first time or whatever, you get that feeling where you're like, oh my God, that's my voice. What will people think, you know? And it's just like, you just like censor yourself and shut down. So I was wondering, uh-oh, uh-oh, there we go, you're back. I'm okay, here. Back. So yeah, I was wondering if yeah. you have, um, if you have any words for the people who are kind of like 
afraid to let things be raw or like afraid of the sound of their voice or afraid of just like recording with like just like raw recordings like do you like what would you do you have anything to say to those people to help them kind of break through that block um you know i feel like starting with organic sound is kind of always the best because it's super fresh it's super flat and then you can manipulate the sound however you want it just really takes patience you know we're not gonna do at, at least for me in my experience it takes me a lot of time before a sound is exactly the way i want it to be and i'll say about 99.9% .9 of the time i'll hear a sound in my head but then i end up making something else that sounds cool and then i'm like oh fuck it i'm going to go with that instead so it's not even off it's not that often that i'm able to even create exactly what i'm hearing or envision in my mind and that's okay because when we force ourselves to do something a very specific way I personally feel like it interferes with our creative freedom and our ability to explore and discover other ways of doing other shit that's also like really fucking cool. So it's, of course, we want to like achieve the goal of making something that we really have in mind. And that's okay too. But we have to find a balance where like, okay, I'm not able to do this right now. So I'm just going to fuck around. And then you end up creating something that's even more cool. And then you're even, you're happy with that. So I, I always try to make a track without having any specifics like, okay, I'm going to make a super deep track right now, or I'm going to make a crazy track right now, or I'm going to make chill step right now. I just, no, I, I just allow myself to be a vessel, play my hand drums for a minute and just see where it goes from there. So my suggestion on trying really hard to make the fattest sound is just let it come to you, play around, plunk around, fuck around until it hits you. And then that makes you more experienced or having more seat time in the tools that you're using so that eventually you will hear a sound in your head and then boom, you're able to just create it just like that. It, it just takes time. Cool. <laughs> cool. That's a, that's a, that's a wonderful answer. That's, that's gold. Yeah. The chat room's definitely, uh, definitely loving that one. Um, uh, okay, cool. So, um, can you tell us about like, um, what was the time in the studio? Like, can you tell us about one? Cause I mean, we all have good days and bad days, you know, and I think for me, so much of it is just showing up and just like, you know, you put in the day, like whether you're inspired or not, you sit down and you do it. And eventually just statistically, there's going to be some magic shit that happens, you know, just, just from just showing up, you know, and so much of it is just about showing up, but there are these days that are magic and it's hard to predict when that's going to happen in advance, but in retrospect, after a magic day, you can learn so much. Can you tell us about one of your just most magical days in the studio and what you learned from it? Oh, <laughs> that's a really big one. Um, oh man. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I have to say my tune Deception, the one we just listened to, is probably the most accomplished session I had in all of my time because for the first time in ever making music, and I mean like ever making music, I had no technical difficulties, I had no struggle, everything was ready. Um, I have massive folders of hand drum recordings and sounds and stuff that I make and sometimes I just don't feel like making music but I want to make a sound or I want to do some raw recordings or I just want to go and walk around the city with my Zoom or my iPhone and record myself drumming on whatever random thing I can find. And having this library not having to recreate or make something allowed for the most smooth creative process ever and it was like butter i mean like butter has been sitting on the counter for like two days and it's just so smooth and so soft that was groundbreaking that was the dream because i was able to just focus on the creative side as opposed to the technical side and i feel like from what i observed as well a lot of producers really want to get super technical and that shit's cool too, man. I'm not really into the technical part. I'm into like the organics. So that's why I put drums and top percussion and drum on fucking houses and shit. But uh, <laughs> I find that it, the more we can have a creative flow, 
the more of a groundbreaking dream session we'll have because essentially we're doing this to create, right? We're putting something together. So why have all these different turns or weird veerings or turn left on the whys that we have to do when we're creating? Like, I personally feel like it would just be better if it was smooth like butter. So yeah, that's, that's, that's an experience that I can share that was like the, the, the dream session. And turns out for me that Deception is probably the hottest track that I think I ever made. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it, it Bass banks. Nectar thinks so. It banks, <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Okay, cool. So, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always telling people to, um, you know, like, because cause like sitting down to write a track, it can take a long time, you know, and sometimes I'll start a, tr- start a session at like, 10 in the morning and I'm still going at like six in the morning the next day, you know, like I try to write it all in one piece and just focus, focus on just like, there is nothing else in my reality except for that track. Just try to get in the zone, stay in the zone and flow. So I'm always telling people to separate their time into, you know, daytime sessions and nighttime sessions. And in the daytime sessions, you're like, you're just focused on finishing that one track and that track is your whole reality and then these other like bite size sessions you're going around and you know you're building up your library you're building up your skills you're building up your muscle memory you're exploring that new plugin you're exploring um whatever um i was hoping that you could say a few words about the different um types of library building and skill building and practice sessions that you do and the different like things that are not necessarily writing that you do that help to facilitate your writing process. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like taking some time aside to just do one thing and one thing only is a part of that seat time to just get better at whatever it is that we want to do. You know, that's how we become a master. And for me, I want to be a master percussionist. So I have been percussion being, I have been a percussion since I want to say officially 14 years old. That's when things really started to become serious for me. And um, I still don't feel like I'm there just yet, but I will get there. And so it's, if we don't take the time to just focus on that one thing that got us started in becoming a producer in the first place, then I feel like you start to lose your romance in what you're doing. Like it now becomes something that you have to do. It becomes a job. You don't have that romantic connection with it anymore because that one thing that got you going in the first place that was right here with you is now going like this. And the more that happens, then the more you start to lose fucking soul and feeling in your music and and it'll get noticed so i just want to say to like all the producers out there think about the reason why you started like what was it or who was it even and uh find like what is that one thing that you want to get your uh, like get across when you're making your music and sometimes just sit and just do that one thing it's because you want to make the sickest synth sound then have days where you literally just sit and go through whatever synthesizer you're using. We'll say Serum, for example. I use none, which we can get into that later. Uh, You can can just, and just make all these different sounds. Resample, resample, and like next thing you know, you have like a folder of like a million different sub sine waves, and you could do a million different things with those because you've made the library for yourself. And now you've created more Uh, creative freedom for yourself because you don't have to sit there and try to find the sound when you could just go through your own library of ones that you made or instead of going through some sample packs that somebody else made which that's cool too uh that creates that seat time for you to become a master in your craft and keep your romance in your dream and what you want to do so yeah there'll be days where i'm not really motivated i'm not really feeling it i smoked a bunch of weed and i'm just like wanting to sit here but i will tell myself nope I need to do some seat time today. So I'll sit there and grab my sticks and drum around or grab my djembe and play around or get my melodica and play around or kalimba and fuck around with my thumbs. Like you just got to sit there and do that one thing that got you started in the first place. Otherwise, why else are you doing it? (laughs) Very cool. Very cool. Um, Okay, cool. So now, so now that um, we've talked about prep, let's talk a little bit about like what, what, you feel uh helps you get in the zone 
and what what can kind of ruin a studio session. So do you want to talk? Uh, let's 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 talk first about like, you know, um, are there any things that you've noticed that that just like ruin a studio session for you? Anything that just like just makes it so like, like that track is gonna come out crap that day? Like anything that's just just pitfalls to avoid. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. I'm learning the balance with that right now, but uh, the one thing that can really kind of kill it for me, I would say, is my projects have grown to be pretty big because I'm doing all of my own sound recordings now, and I will like want, want like one crash throughout the entire track, and I want that crash to be so perfect it has its own channel, but I want these other crashes too, and then it's in its own channel. So now my Ableton project went from 24 channels to 74 and now everything isn't organized because I'm just too in it I just want to like put this here and move on to the next thing so not staying organized it can kill it for me because now it's any honestly no let me retract that and say that better anything that gets in the way of my creative flow can kind of kill it for me because that valve of of like creativity is being blocked by whatever's clogging the pipes because I have to figure something else out and I can't, it, 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 it just kills it for me. So I'll try and get through it. But then once I figure out whatever it is, that's causing my Ableton to crash. I'm just kind of like over it. So yeah, organization, keeping everything organized. The moment I like command T for a new audio channel, I label it right away. And now I don't have to worry about it anymore. So my biggest suggestion would be to stay organized from the very beginning. How do you feel about like uh, like sometimes during the process, I'll be working on something, especially like when you're working with analog synths. Like I love working with analog synths, but um, you know you'll find like like I sometimes envy the people producing in like the '80s because like all the fucking classic riffs like weren't taken yet. You know, and like I'll be playing something and I'll get like a saw wave or some really basic sound wave and I'll be like, oh, that sounds so good. And then I find a riff and then I'm like, oh, damn it. That's like tainted love. I can't use that fucking riff, you know, yeah. or whatever. And it's like <laughs> yeah. you find things where it's like you're kind of like like it'll sound good to you because you're kind of like subconsciously copying your influences or subconsciously copying something that you've heard before. And then, you know, you have, you know, it's like you got to navigate the waters. Like, it's like, do you, do you, do you accept something that sounds familiar knowing that you're going to manipulate it further to make it not sound so familiar? Or do you reject things that sound familiar and keep trying until you come up with something that sounds new? How do you find that balance in your music? It's really hard because so much of everything has already been done. And you know, I feel like a lot of ideas today are piggyback or piggybacking off of other good ideas. So it's not like you're stealing or you're copying. It's just like that's what came through. That's how you feel. Personally, I don't run into that. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but I can't recall myself creating and then being like, oh, man, this sounds like this. Uh, like or a melody or something or a riff that I've done. Um, so I, I can't really say that I've, I've gone through that, but I don't think it's a personally, I don't think that it's a bad thing if you're playing on the keyboard and then you like end up playing a little bit of earth, wind and fire. Like you got a little melody of that in there. It was one of the, some of the greatest music of all time. So is it really that bad if like one of your riffs has a, like a few of the keys that they played in there? I don't see anything wrong with that. So I, it's obviously you don't want to like completely copy something, but again, all good ideas are borrowed from other good ideas. So I don't see anything wrong with it. Okay, cool. Cause I know a lot of, a lot of artists I find, um, they get really precious about ideas about originality and like, yeah. To me, like I'm always just like, yo, you didn't invent the, the twelve tone scale. You didn't invent four four time signature. 
You know, like, it's like, how original, like, what do you want? You want to, like, take the artist and, like, be like, okay, you're going to live in this, like, space pod and you're going <laughs> to orbit the earth and you're not going to consume any media from earth and we're just going to leave you there with all these musical instruments and see, it's like, what even is, what do you, I don't know, it just seems, it's a bit pointless. I'm down to go to a space pod point. for a little bit and make some music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you ever, um, so, so how about, uh, like, well, let's talk about isolation then. Uh, do you, like... Do you ever like go on go wood shedding? You know, do you ever go like uh like the, there's this they call it wood shedding where like you go work on your chops, you know, and you isolate yourself and uh, go out in the woods and 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 do you, like do you do you ever take time like pointedly time out to go compose in your calendar or is it just like kind of a habit? Like how does how does it work with your calendar? How does isolation play into your um... process? Well, now it's forced isolation, so it's kind of all that I do. <laughs> but I just kind of let it flow naturally. My creativity for production comes in waves. I can't force myself to be creative, and there are just times where I just – I don't want to call it writer's block because I'm not blocked by anything. It's just I just don't have it in me. So I may have, like, a lack of inspiration or a lack of mute, uh, muse or something that isn't, like, having me go – Oh shit! I need to go write this down right now. It, it it comes in waves, you know. I am a working professional, so my job takes up a good amount of time of my life. Um, but I do have some discipline in how I make time for myself and my music, uh, as well as my personal life. And um, yeah, it's just finding that balance can be really tough, but. Uh, don't feel like you have to force yourself to do something every day. I will go a week or two without even opening Ableton or touching any of my really? drums. Then yeah, it, it I yeah, because I'm just busy doing other shit, or sometimes I just want to veg or do whatever. And but when I do open it, it's like a refresh. It's like oh, this is this this feels this feels fresh to me. Um, I have to take space. From everything. I mean, now I have to take space from my job. I have to take space from gigging. I have to take space from everything, you know, everything in moderation. And that even means my love and my passion in music. Sometimes I got to tell her to, hey, go on vacation. I'll be back later. And and I do. So it's, it's just important to know that you got to take time away as well, just as much as you have to put time into it. Um, too much of something isn't good and too little of something isn't good. So... No, like if you're feeling a writer's block, don't get mad at yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Don't be like, ah, oh, why can't I just fucking make something right now? It's totally okay. You just probably need some inspiration, something that's going to spark that fire or that juice. And just a little bit of space could be what you need. Huh. Right. That's, that's, those are wise words. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. So, okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, inspiration then. Cause like, I mean, I, I've had, I've had my kind of like, I've kind of had my uninspired period and I found I've made some of my most inspired music when I wasn't feeling inspired to sit down. Like when I just kind of like made myself do it and then like some fucking cool ass shit just happens and I'm like, oh my God, oh, I'm so excited about this now. What was <laughs> an uninspiring day is now a very inspired day, you know? Yeah. And it's like. But, you know, then there are other days where you're like, you know, you're thinking about it and it's been like a couple of days and you're like, I, I have shit to do today and I can't get in there. Right? But I know that on like fucking Sunday, I can. And I'm just like, you're just getting all fucking ready. And then Sunday comes and you're like, boom, you know, so like how, um, you know, what's your relationship with inspiration? You know, how, how does it play into your process? Uh, are there times when you're ins more inspired, less inspired? Does it help you get in the zone? Do you find your way into the zone? Like how – inspiration and the zone, how do they work together in your process? Um, hmm. I've never been asked that before. That's, that's very – that's a really interesting thing to think about. Uh. I don't want to sound too hippie, but I am a bit. And I kind of just do my best to stay in the flow and let things be presented to me when they should without trying to force too hard. Um, but I guess a lot of things that influence my inspiration would be 
when something goes well at work, uh, I have like monthly reviews with my uh, higher ups and whenever they're telling me, you're fucking crushing it, I'm like, sick, I'm gonna go drum. That fuels <laughs> my inspiration or taking some time away because I'm gonna go camping with just me and my dog for a couple of nights, silencing out the world and being able to just be there with me and my dog, that's inspiring because I get to come back fresh with a clean slate. Um, and uh, oh, let's see, I'm glad I'm speaking to your soul, sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, this has and, been great. Uh, You've been killing it. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it, I guess it just really depends what's going on in my life is what will have, it, what will trigger inspiration or not. If like, I don't know. I'm getting emails left and right from my managers at Pivotal and my agents at Submission that my gigs is canceling here and my gig is canceling here. I fall into this really sad space and I'm not feeling too creative. Um, so it, it, without that inspiration or motivation, I kind of just, for me, I kind of just don't even try because I'm just, I, I just, I just don't want to, frankly. Um, so I, if I try forcing myself, I feel like I'm trying too hard. And because I'm a kind of person that likes to just be in flow, it, it, things get off kelter when I do that. So I guess to sum it all down, it's more about what's going on in my life that will influence my inspiration or my motivation. And that could be down to, damn, I just had a fucking good steak right now. I feel like I'm going to make a track or... Uh, my man did something really sweet for me and I'm just like, oh my God, I feel so happy. I'm going to go make a love song. You know, it just, it just really depends on what's going on in my life okay. and that, all aspects of my life. Well, that, that, okay. So that's, that's, um, that's a really cool answer. And that, um, that actually kind of leads me to, um, that actually leads me to kind of, uh, an overarching sort of thing that I've noticed about your music and that, that I try to put into my own music and that is really that, you know, because I feel like a lot of people out there, they try to make music that is about technique and it is about, you know, ticking all the boxes of a certain genre. It's about being the most in some way, you know, and they see the sounds that they're collecting, uh, especially those that rely heavily on commercial sound libraries. They see their sounds that they're collecting, these collections of sounds, as a tool to be better than the next person at Dimension X. You know, whether you <laughs> want to be like the biggest or the loudest or, you know, the fucking most sound designy or the most like whatever, right? And... I feel like a lot of those people come from a competitive mindset and they feel very threatened by other people who are making music. And that has always mystified me because to me, my music is an expression of my life. It's, it's an expression of, of myself as a human being, of my experiences and my, you know, my story. And I feel like when you view the music as an expression of your own life and you put as much of as much of personal meaning as you can into the music that that helps it to be more emotionally impactful and more memorable for people right and you know you keep coming back to this this you know you're like yo this this music is is soul this music is coming from me and like you know when i'm drumming and when i'm just like becoming a vessel I'm letting it come through me and letting it flow from these like deeper levels of being. Uh, I feel like you really, you really are putting your, your life and your soul into your music. And I think that that's why, you know, that's why it sounds so good. And that's why I think a lot of people uh, can resonate with it so much. So I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about how, you know how you put your life into your music how you how you put your thumbprint on everything and how you make it an expression of you as a human being as opposed to just like this collection of sounds you know what is it that makes your music you what is it that that makes it expressive how how do you how do you open that channel 
Well, for starters, I stay away from as much digital gear as possible. <laughs> I don't use scents. I don't use analogs. I don't use any of that. I literally have, and this is over the years of recording of my own samples. Uh, I take some samples and I'll resample them by layering them in another project. So say for instance, I grab an Ill Gates texture and it goes, wow, I'll take that sound and I will cut it, chop it, resample it, maybe put some other textures on there. And the next thing you know, I created my own sound. And resampling to me is a lot more fun than opening up massive and like, what the fuck is this knob? What does this do? I don't have time for that. <laughs> this is not, not my jam. Um, and I, as a percussionist, I try to not try. I incorporate as many organic sounds and textures as I can. So starting with my gear or starting with my instruments, uh, it's all wood, it's all rawhide, it's all metal. And it, for me, is me because I'm a very, I mean, I've been a farmer for 10 years, so I'm all about getting dirty and nature and organic uh, eating, organic growing. I like to be as natural as I possibly can and free from all the extra noise. So um, I feel like because I only incorporate things that are organic, like the way I do my percussion and my music, um, like in a lot, a lot of my sounds, like I could walk around the city and I'll hear a sound and I'll grab that because it's a natural sound that's happening. Like listen to the wheels of this tractor go across this field right now. Damn, it's squeaking really loud. You know, like that to me is organic sound. Um, it's also a labor of love if you're driving the tractor. That's some serious shit right there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and um, for example, Deception. It's a very metallic like track. I'd say that's probably one of my most metal tr tracks there are because it's a lot of a lot of ambiance going on in there and all the different layers of those ambiance in there those ambiance sounds is the, the metallic is like uh sounds of being in the bay area i used to live in west oakland just for a very short period What's of time up? a little bit before ghost ship uh oh, the ghost ship fire and uh tragic. there's just a lot of machinery machine sounds and so i recorded those sounds years ago and i just started using them that's how big and massive all of my recordings are those recordings i captured on a zoom uh, a zoom is really awesome i absolutely love it but i don't always have it so i do use my iphone probably more than anything else to be honest when i'm out in the field obviously when i'm at home i have an akg and a sure 57 but uh yeah i do my best to just incorporate as many natural sounds as i can and uh but some of those mid bass range, the womp, 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 that's in Deception, that's a resampled sound. You know, I probably got that from a Leon Switch sample pack and just ran it through so many times and pitched it down or up, whatever. And now it's my own sound. So it's <laughs> that's that's how I feel like I'm able to execute getting my essence in my track is by sticking to my beliefs uh, even my spiritual beliefs as a pagan woman and incorporating nature and balance as natural as possible and uh yeah so that's that that's what i do <laughs> very cool very cool that's that's a great answer awesome so um <laughs> is there uh are there any sounds that are like uh kind of easter eggs that are in some of your tracks that you can be like hey you know Check out this track. No one will know this, but I know that this sound came from this place. And when you know this <laughs> sound, you listen for it, you can hear it. Like, is there any any uh, any cool Easter egg that we could check out? Yeah, definitely. Um, Shakti sound is all 100% organic, original sounds, except for the 808 kicks. Um, <laughs> that came stock on Ableton, so I just used that. But... Um, <clears throat> Shakti sound is all natural elements. Uh, all the drums are hand played, uh, recorded at Shakti sound. For those that are unfamiliar with Shakti sound is, a uh, brief synopsis on that is it is a retreat that a couple of girlfriends of, of mine uh, put together and we do a week long um, workshop on music production, DJing, mm -hmm. intro to all of these things. 
and everything in between. So spirituality and wrapped cool. around, you know, the I want to go to that. So it's, it's great. So um, at Shakti Sound, uh, we did it at the Sierra Hot Springs, which is just a little bit north of where I am now. Um, there is a silent dome. Uh, all of our students were in there and then they were all some it's you're supposed to be quiet, but you're they all started singing. The acoustics in this silent dome sounded like I was sitting in a room with angels. I couldn't believe it. And we were all in there just singing, making sounds. And I was like, wait. And then I got out of the hot tub, butt naked, ran to the lockers across the field, <laughs> cold as ever, grabbed my iPhone 7 and ran back across the field, <laughs> got back in. I was like, I hope you guys don't mind. I am going to record this. And there's like a little Buddha man sitting there. I put my phone on there and I kind of led some ohms, some sounds. Um, so in there, you will hear a lot of water, a lot of natural reverb. I utilized the, the air, the space that I was in to mix the natural sounds. I hardly did any mixing on these. And you'll be able to hear all that. Um, my, uh, what is it? My hats. Uh, um, those are actually eggshells that a student what? brought to shock you down. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, so the whole track is based around these angels that were singing in the hot spring. And uh, yeah, go ahead and take oh, it from here. Is, that is so cool. Great. That's awesome. What a dope tune. What a dope tune. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, some of those textures in there, like that undertone, was like water moving through some pipes. <laughs> and otherwise, everything else that you heard were all sounds of all the students in there singing, getting down, and, and doing their thing. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, that tune sounds sounds excellent. And I, you know, I I often give people this challenge when I'm doing the the mixtape rules in the dojo. I feel like some of the strongest mixtapes, like uh, I think it was mixtape number two, where I gave them a challenge like no synths, all sounds must be organic and come from a microphone at some point. And I was really really pleased with the results because I think like you know I think where a lot of people go astray is when they're like 
they feel like sound design is like a chore or like it's hard or like they need to like leave it to the sound designers, you know? And then like, like they're just going to like, they're just going to use other people's sounds and like focus on the composition. But then, um, you know, a lot of the time you end up with this composition that's just like, doesn't really mean anything to you. It doesn't really express anything to you. And I think because of that, you're going to end up like being a bit insecure and then like trying to just keep ramming stuff in there. And I feel like your music, like it always feels like it's like enough, but at the same time, you're not just like fucking cramming too much shit in there. You know, you're not like, you're <laughs> not sorry, like, but Blunner said a hundred percent free range organic. <laughs> yeah totally you should put that on a little sticker on your next release <laughs> yeah I mean he's Blunter S. Wompson he's a pretty badass name right so he's, he's obviously <laughs> obviously pun game is, is on fleek um, but yeah so so did, did, did you have to like learn to not put too much shit or is it like do you think it's just like a natural product of, of making your own sounds with the mic or like I, you know where does that minimalism and that that confidence to be minimal come from um growing up i didn't have too much fucking mosquitoes growing up i didn't have too much of things um while I did grow up fortunate, my mother was a successful woman. I, I grew up in a nice house and really nice neighborhood, whatever, suburban beach. It was, it was chill. We always lived very minimally. And I think because the my life is very minimal, I only ever have what I need. Um, it also comes out in my music because um, I don't need too much to get my point on that art across. It just comes natural to me. I think that's also kind of why dubstep is my favorite electronic music genre uh, is because even though it's so simple, it's also like, like, oh, how did you get it to be so simple and so cool when it's just a snare kick and a hi-hat for two minutes? But it's like, it, 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 it can be done. So I don't know. I think just because I'm naturally a minimalistic kind of person and live very minimal, it comes out of my music. I don't sit there and try to say, oh, I need to do less of this. There are more times where I'm like, ah, oh, should I add more? Should I do this? But then I'm like, no, if I have to ask myself if I should do it, I probably shouldn't because then that means it's not, it's not me. Oh, huh, very cool. Very cool. Um, okay, cool. So uh, we're, we're getting to, it's been an hour now, so I think we should probably open it up for, uh, for questions and stuff. Um, do any yeah. of you out there have any questions for Gabrielle, a hundred drums, do any of you have any questions for her while she's here? If pew, you pew. have questions, pop them up into the chat. Now is your time. Speak up. Yeah. But thank you for answering all of my questions. There's definitely a, there's definitely a lot of a lot of questions that I've been meaning to ask. So yeah, feels, feels <laughs> This good. went naturally as it should. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Mafunka asks, those hats were eggshells? <laughs> Yeah, so I actually am not that great at playing eggshells, but if you listen to original dub hats, like some of the hats that are in King Tubby's music, or if you listen to hats that are in Kaiju's music, they're very like that, and it was really hard to figure out how to make that how to make the hats very specific like that. But what it is, it's it's eggshells layered on top of eggshells. I literally. Like that sound probably has twenty audio channels what? of me just playing eggshells with it, with very little reverb. Eggshells. There, for me, I've learned that. So you played it with sticks and shake and shakers. Nope, no sticks. Just eggshells and shakers. Just, just one egg on another. Huh? Just one egg on another, hitting them, or like, what, what are you hitting the eggshell with? Uh, now I'm shaking it. Okay. So it's like a shaker, I guess. Like it, I'm like for me, an eggshell is like a shaker. Okay. Right, because it's like an egg, and it's, you shake it. Unless there's another kind of eggshell, but oh, I thought you were talking about like it. an actual chicken's egg. Oh no. No, no. Okay, okay. You're just talking. No. About, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I just have an egg shaker, and oh, okay, I just okay. layer it so many times, and then I cut it to make it really nice and tight. Got and, it. Uh, yeah, I, I I remember that that hat has 27 channels of me like. To make it really big, because those. So did you bounce it down, or did you like in the final project where there's still 27 channels? 
in in post production, I mixed it down a bit. Uh, but uh, as I'm recording, no, I don't do anything to touch it because I can get it to sound how I want later. It's just to get it in there. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's so. That's that's what that is, and one of my favorite samples I've ever made. In fact, in, in a lot of my music, I use those those hats because it's it's my favorite, and I love how piercing the egg shaker is. So that's why I tend to use it a lot. In a lot of my music, I'll have shakers and whatnot to kind of pick up the, the pace. But uh, yeah, those hats and stuff are layers of shakers, <laughs> egg shakers. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so uh, Sub Assignment asks, do you play the kit or just hand percussion? Thank you for coming on. Um, I grew up playing a kit, but as I got older, it's really hard to have space that allows for a kit. So that's when I, that's why I say about 14 years old is when becoming a percussionist came really prevalent because I was able to invest in getting hand drums and playing those wherever I am. So I'm not a kit drummer. I'm a percussionist. Okay. Very cool. Um, so Squale says, how has it been in Colorado the past few days? I know it was crazy. Did you get any protest sounds? Um, I did go to one of the protests. It was very hard for me. Um, we didn't get into it too much, but a quick little thing is I am a victim of our unjust racial system. I was attacked and defended myself and was jailed for that. And I actually started a GoFundMe that Dylan was big support uh, with getting that going. Thank you, Dylan, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, gonna, I was saving that for the end, but yeah, we can get into it. We can get into it now. Um, yeah, it's really and, uh, uh, it's yeah, terrible. So you totally don't deserve that. I stepped out for a little bit, and it was, it, it was a little tough being out there hearing Black Lives Matter when I'm, like, surrounded by a bunch of white people. It was really interesting, really interesting. So, yes, uh, but because of how crazy it's been, not in a bad way, it is peaceful. I needed to come home to Grass Valley to – drain out the noise cool and um yeah i was actually uh, just going to suggest that um the people here uh make a donation you know if you've appreciated this weekly download and you've appreciated what uh, gabrielle has said had to share um she's got this gofundme going but uh probably that's going to be like because this weekly download will be there forever and i'm sure people will watch this like years from now um do you have like a paypal.me slash 100 drums or anything or do, is there a paypal yeah everything's make? at 100 drums um the gofundme is still up i did reach my goal uh but i am keeping it for the rest of the week because the additional funds that are being raised uh, will go towards me finally getting to see a professional and start working on treatment for my PTSD. And then a portion will be donated to the NAACP because they did show up for my court case back in 2016. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, well, and, but, well, uh, is there, is there like an evergreen PayPal that's not like, like if they go to just paypal.me slash a hundred drums, drums, they can yep, donate? It's okay. there. Okay. Or you heard it, people. Paypal.me slash a hundred drums. So yeah. yeah, get in there. Um, you know, not, not just because of the incident, like but because you're awesome. Um, okay, cool. So uh, yeah, there's a bunch more questions. So let's get to Imperium. So uh, Gabrielle, are your drum processing techniques simple or complex or somewhere in the middle? It just depends how I'm feeling. Um, I can do something real simple. I can play a loop or sometimes I'll get into throwing down. It just depends what comes out. Um, but I... Uh, naturally know the different time signatures and styles of African drumming and Cubano drumming. Cool. Um, if someone wanted to get into African drumming or Cubano drumming, what are some things that they could Google that would help them, you know, trigger the right videos or the right, like the right things? To um, just up? African drum rhythms or, or Cuban drum rhythms. And there's a lot of YouTube videos of my people playing their music and just listen. You know, I, for me, I feel like if you're going to get into music and you want to be a music producer, you need to know how to feel music. Music shouldn't always just be a mental thing. Drumming is a very, very physical thing that, believe it or not, drummers and percussionists don't count. It's just, we just know. Uh, whereas other people I know have to count, which is fine. But yeah, just Google up those and then there'll be a lot of resources that you can go to to, to check it out, to listen or if you're a mathematics or math kind of person then you can go online and find how to do the math on the signatures and play it out yourself okay cool so what's your live setup like um i don't 
perform live because I like to keep things simple when I'm playing shows. So I am a producer, but I am a DJ first. And I say that because I started DJing before I started producing. And I really enjoy DJing. I got into DJing because I'm passionate about other people's music. And I don't want to ever lose that. So I make music to incorporate within my set. So when I'm performing, I play on CDJs. I have Tractor on my MacBook Air. Uh, and I play an H- H- HI demo because I have I like to have all of my music with me, not just yeah. some weird little flash drive and the little spinny thingy. I can't stand that. Um, so yeah, I just I DJ on CDJs. That's pretty much my setup. Okay, cool. So uh, what are you listening to these days? Um, right now, I am listening to primary primarily classical piano. Um, I don't listen to electronic music on my free time. Um, I'm actually exploring a few different bands. Uh, Icelandic bands, uh, which is nice. really awesome. My boyfriend, he spent some time mm-hmm. in Iceland and he's just like super into it and has been introducing me to a lot of Icelandic bands. So I've been getting into that a lot. And particularly by myself, I listen to classical music or more specifically classical piano. Very cool. Okay. So, um, uh, what about, uh, for capturing hand percussion, what is your best advice? For capturing, capturing, do you mean like uh, recording? Yeah, recording. Yeah, for recording hand percussion, what's your best advice? Okay. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, I have a Shure SM57, and I do have it attached to a cast iron uh, stand. The more sturdy, the better. And, uh, you know, obviously I have that plugged into my sound card. I make an audio channel in Ableton and turn on the swing arm so that it gets the live tracking. And when I'm playing, I like to record my drums from the bottom. So I'll put my mic down there and I typically have it arched a little bit while I'm sitting in my seat and record from the bottom. Because every now and then I like to do these pitch bends uh, where it's like uh, you, I'm I'm playing this way, but as I'm playing this way, this part of my hand will ease on the hide and it bends the sound of the drum. And the only way you could really get that in recordings if you record from the bottom. So uh, that's primarily how I record and capture it. Okay, cool. So um, Sean Jay says, I'm trying to wrap my head around your process for building a library. Do you classify Foley sounds for what you use them for or what the recording is of? What the recording is of. So I have a folder that says hand drum. And then each folder is organized by date. Um, because I can kind of remember where I, what, what place I was in of my life around that time. So for example, uh, the last one that I did is, uh, uh, djembe rawhide. Cause that's, that's, that the djembe that I have has a particular rawhide, uh, head and, uh, it'll just be that month. So everything that I record for that entire month of March will be labeled djembe rawhide March, 2020. And then uh, I'll have a million of different samples in there. Some are 30 seconds, some are 10 minutes, some are a half hour if I'm really feeling it. And uh, and then that's how I organize it and, and save it for later. Okay, cool. So Leo asks, what mics do you prefer for recording hand drums compared to singing bowls, shakers, and djembe? Do you find certain mics work better for certain percussion instruments, woods, metals, skins, etc.? Um... For me, no. There's so many different mics for so many different things, but for vocals, I use an AKG. And then for my instruments, I simply just use my same Shure SM57 on the cast iron stand. And it's a desk stand, so it's a very short mic stand and it lives on my desk, easy to move it around. Um, And I just play right over it. And then again, I'll have my uh, AKG on its own stand with the vocal buffer, whatever it's called, and and use that for my vocal stuff. And I'm not a singer, I'm not a rapper, it's not really my thing, but what I do do is I use uh, voice accents a lot. Like, I'll laugh or in deception, I say a few words in the intro, um, or I do a lot of breaths, or every now and then I'll layer my own shakers in my own voice, and I just kind of do those things. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so any plans for a sample pack release or do you have any sample packs out? I do not have any sample packs out and as of now, I don't have any plans for a sample pack. Oh, out. we'll have to fix that. <laughs> okay, cool. So, I thought about it. it. It would take a lot of work, but 
I, I could potentially be be into it later down the line. <laughs> cool, cool. So Katie Slowform asks, so with most of your percussions, are you writing it in while you're laying out your initial arrangement then? I feel like most of the time with my music, I'll get a rough arrangement out with just like a kick snare melody and some wubs and then go back into layer the percussion after. But now I'm thinking of putting more focus on percussion from the start. Uh, well, th I... <sighs> The way I start making music when I'm like, okay, today I'm going to make a track. I launch Ableton, get my recording gear ready, and I turn the grid off of Ableton because I don't want anything quantized. I want to have as much freedom as possible. And I turn the metronome on, obviously at 140 BPM. And then um, I'll sit there and then, you know, do, 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 do. And then I'll just start laying down some hand drums. I will just do that until I'm done. And sometimes my project will go on for 10 minutes. And now that I have this layered, listen back. Okay, I want this track to be around four minutes. So I'll cut it to five. And then from there, in the and then I just start layering from there. So it depends if I want to go forward step, back step, half step. It just it, it so many different ideas come when I already have a foundation to build off of. Okay, very cool. So favorite pot strain. Favorite posturing? Yeah, favorite favorite strain of weed, marijuana, cannabis. What's your fave? Oh, uh, last year uh, I grew Gorilla Glue number four, which is from the original cut, and it had lasted me literally until I came back out here because I sold everything that I had and I had enough to last me for a year. Um, so GG four. I'm into indicas. I'm, I'm already kind of like an anxiety kind of person, so uh, I, I like indicas. So GG four for sure. Um, and, uh, Gorilla Glue, it's GG4. And I guess right now my new favorite, it's called Pussy Print. It's Pussy Print. Mwah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. What a name. Pussy Print. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. So what should we be on the lookout for from you in the future? Anything dropping soon-ish? Yeah. So, uh, this Friday I will be playing a pre-recorded 30 minute set, uh, with electric Hawk and solidarity of black lives matter. Um, and then I June, July 2nd, um, I will be playing, um, uh, the summer eyes or summer eyes digital festival as well. I'm playing it uh, also. It's going to yeah, be fun. Dylan is going to be on there as well. Easy bakes. There's a fat lineup. So, uh, you can expect to see both of us on that. And those are the two things that I have uh, scheduled for now. So again, uh, Friday, this coming Friday, Electric Hawk, time, time uh, slot should be announced soon, but the lineup is up. Um, and then July 2nd with Bill Gates uh, with Summer Eyes. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Um, all right, so now uh, I want to shift focus a little bit from the questions and just um, get a little bit more serious, you know. Um, it's a pretty crazy time out there, and it's, you know, it's pretty intense. There's a lot of, a lot of emotions uh, flaring up, and I think that, you know, a lot of people are seeing this as a time of division, which I think in some ways it is, but... To me, I've been seeing a lot of uh, really powerful unity out there and I've been seeing a lot of people uh, coming together and a lot of people who maybe were not um, open to the Black Lives Matter cause, really seeing seeing it for what it is and seeing, that, seeing the importance of it uh, for all people not just for black people. And I was wondering if, um, you know, if you had any thoughts on this and um, you know how how people of all races can help. <sighs> it's always like a hard question because I don't really like feeling like it's my responsibility to teach people how to be um, or what they should do. I feel like a lot of this should come pretty naturally but with everything going on in the world right now I'll just keep this simple I think it would just be best for people to just be kind and be mindful and to not 
feel like, oh my God, well, we we have to be extra special with black people right now because of what's going on. No, no. The thing is, yes, all lives matter. All lives matter. But just imagine this, you know, white people and black people, um, one is a tiger, one is a lion. The tigers are going instinct. So we need to put our focus on that part of the animal kingdom to keep everything balanced. So the way to do that is just by, if you're a producer or you're putting things together, or you're gathering uh, a gatherer of people of some source, whatever that is, um, you know, be obviously mindful of not saying, oh, I, I, I should probably find a black person. No, I think it should be, let me look at the circle of people that I've gathered here and I want to represent diversity. I want to represent change. And by representing, by wanting to represent those things, just take simple action. So diversify your surroundings. Um, learn about Africa. Just learn about our heritage or where we come from or learn about slavery. I'll tell you what, it's fucking hard to learn about that shit because my grandparents were slaves and hearing their stories was crazy. Like I have my grandmother's slave gown and there's blood on it and I don't want to know where it came from, but it's really heart wrenching to know like if none of that changed, would I be a slave right now? Yeah, I'd probably be some slaves somewhere building fucking buildings or something because I'm quite the builder. <laughs> I'm really good at it. So my biggest suggestion in, in making change and what's going on right now is to just put the intention out there to diversify your surroundings and and and, and just listen and learn. Very cool. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, right on. So um, I want to talk uh, a little bit too about um, music history, you know, and I think like, you know, one of the things that I – want you know one of the actions that i really want to take is to educate people a little bit more about music history because i feel like to properly understand music history is you know you can't like you can't learn about heavy metal without learning about the satanic panic and like the west memphis three you know you can't learn about house music without learning about the gay black men who made it in the 80s to the very beginning you know you can't fabulous yeah you, you can't learn about rave music without learning about the repetitive beats and crack house laws that were used to crack down on the scene in like uh in the 90s and stuff right so um you know i really want to be shifting a bit more of my focus you know, in these weekly downloads, like the class uh, last week on on dub mixing, I thought was, um, you know, I, I felt really good to teach that class. And I think I think there's a lot that we could learn from it. But I think that like, you know, a lot of the a lot of the most important music comes from struggle, you know, and it comes from it comes from, you know, processing these emotions that are maybe not all smiles and sunshine, you know. And I was wondering if, um, you know, if if the struggle and if just like processing emotions, you know, just is is there any way that you approach your own music in terms of like processing pain and just like helping helping you to just kind of like like do you ever use your music as as therapy? Um, and do you ever uh, you know do, does 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 that that processing have any role in your your creative flow? Yeah, um, when I started developing my own taste in music, hard rock and heavy metal is obviously where I went. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even today, I'm still learning that a lot of that music stems from black culture. I didn't even fucking know that. I'm like, what? Niggas is listening to metal? Who knew that? So it's kind of like, <laughs> I'm even still learning about the background of music culture. Um, Music is definitely a therapy. I, I don't think I would be alive today if it weren't for music, in all honesty. Yeah, I've, I've been through the ringer, for sure. Um, so, But I, in my music in particular, I'm not really thinking about that. the fact that I'm half Black. It doesn't really matter to me. You know, I feel like if there's any side of me that my music still uh, stems from is probably my Cuban side because I'm a percussionist. And... I was really close with my father from him being far, so I feel like a lot more connected with my Latina side than my African side. So 
I, I, I that's kind of how I feel because uh, I tend to do more Cuban signatures than African. This is a little harder to be honest, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just it just really depends. I just try to not really think about that too much. And as someone that grew up in an all white suburban beach neighborhood, typically the only black person on lineups and female at that, because we all know that the ADM industry is dominated by males. It's it's. I really just try to not think about those things too much and just be strong and be powerful in my voice, carry myself well and encourage other women to join me and empower other women to do it as well. I feel like that is what I need to do to make the change and be the difference. So fuck all that noise. Let's just, <clears throat> let's do it. <laughs> fuck yeah. <laughs> That's a that's a great answer. Okay, cool. Well, uh, I'm with you. I'm with you. I support that entirely, <laughs> um, and I'm really uh, yeah, I'm really excited uh, for our gigs together. I'm really excited for your new music, and uh, I just want to say thanks so much for taking the time to join us on the weekly download. Uh, and yeah, if you've appreciated the weekly download. Uh, paypal.me slash 100 drums Gabrielle could I'm sure appreciate your donations it's uh, rough out there for musicians with COVID and everything you know these <laughs> yeah. streaming gigs they're not paying like uh, real gigs I'll tell you that little little, little <laughs> look behind yeah. the curtain you know it's not like a, not like a real gig so um, <laughs> yeah so your support definitely counts um, lots of love to each and every one of you in the audience I appreciate your, your comments in the chat and everything be sure to go follow 100 drums on all of the different social medias and uh, watch out for more 100 drums collabs and things in the future more more different ways that we're going to team up um, all right lots of love everybody that is the weekly download for this week thanks again gabrielle and thanks, everybody uh, yeah, for being stay here. strong fight the power everybody Thank you so much for watching our video. If you like this content and you want to see more, it would really mean a lot for you to support the channel by subscribing, clicking like on this video, or dropping a comment below. Is there anything we missed? Is there anything else that you'd like to see? We are listening, so please don't be shy. Like, subscribe, and comment. This channel is for you, and we need to hear your voice. Step in my